Hello astrologer friends of the world. My name is Stephen Good. I'm an astrologer and pedagogue. I live in Mallorca, an island in Spain, a beautiful place where Mr. Nicholas Campion, who's here on my left, has a summer house and I'm about to conduct an interview with him. Uh, I think many of you probably know this book, the book of world horoscopes. It's one of the most influential books of the 20th century as for mundane astrology. So, Nicholas, thank you for this immense privilege. Let's go inside and get this interview underway. Thank you. <laughs> so here we go with the first part of this interview. This section is addressed to basically anyone with an open mind, anyone who has an interest in social affairs, historical, sociological, financial, and maybe as well psychological. So I think it's an amazing privilege to be able to interview this man, Nicholas Campion, and um, anyone who is interested in these subjects, as I say, from international affairs, um, sociological patterns, and basically anyone who asks himself or herself about the reasons for patterns in history, why things happen, anyone with a curiosity to understand the mechanics of life, the mechanics of social change, um, will be able to enjoy this. Afterwards, there's going to be a section for those of you who are more specialized in astrology, who those of you who have studied a bit of astrology or have done some homework by yourselves. And this part is addressed to anyone. So, Nick, to begin with, why don't you tell us a tiny bit about what astrology actually is and how it can help us understand social or mundane subjects. Well, astrology is actually a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. okay? All cultures have a version of it as concerned with attributing meaning or significance to the sky in relation to human affairs. And the, the sky, remember, is half our environment. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think there's a single human culture that has thought it can't look at the sky, patterns in the sky, order in the sky, and not derive some meaning for daily life, for human affairs. So we've got systems in China, the Aztec and Maya system, Sub-Saharan Africa, obviously what we're most familiar with uh, are probably the, the Indian and Western systems. Okay, they're, they're closely related. And the Western system has created this vast edifice of zodiac signs uh, with which most people are familiar and planetary meanings. And then these are used to uh, interpret life, to predict the future, and the sum total of those two aspirations is to manage the present. This is what astrology always comes down to, is managing the present. Through self-understanding, through arranging events or uh, just uh, trying to fit in with what are perceived as overall cycles. Okay, so you start by perhaps surprising a lot of people by putting the emphasis on the present rather than on the future. This is interesting. But why don't you tell us about which is exactly the, the, the tool that astrologers use the, the, when we're speaking of social issues. Because I do believe most people are familiar with the fact that they have a natal chart. There is such a thing as a natal chart. So when we're talking about uh, financial issues or predicting the possibility of war or crisis or uh, an abundant phase of prosperity, um, how do mundane astrologers reach these conclusions? What is the tool that they are using? Okay, the first thing is, uh, most people know why they have a natal chart, which is a representation of the planets and the zodiac signs for the time they're born. So that's just a matter of convenience. Okay, you don't have to represent a chart in the circular form most people know. You could set the chart out as a set of wavy lines if you wanted. So all astrology can use this diagram. So, astrologers working in the financial sphere may create a chart, a horoscope, for, say, the launch of a currency, 
for the inauguration of a company. And astrologers working, say, looking at politics, will use a chart perhaps for the independence of a country. And, and in, in some places where astrology is still used, for example in India, the astrologers may be actively involved in choosing an auspicious moment to set a chart for, for the inauguration of a government, uh, the holding of an election, uh, for example. So it seems that there's actually more than one type of tool or way of measuring astrological variables for social questions. Exactly. Uh, we create systems for measurement. Okay. Okay, so you might have centigrade or Fahrenheit for temperature, for example, uh, feet and inches or meters for length. So, th so all measurements are just convenient points. So astrology has developed various different ways of measuring. But the important feature, I think, of astrology is the way in which it matches measurement with meaning. And so the measurement always has a meaning. So this might be one way in which we can contrast astrology with astronomy. Astronomy really deals primarily with measurement, and astronomers might then think those measurements are meaningful, they provide some sense to our understanding of the universe. But for astrology, the, sh the move towards meaning is always primary. So an astrologer will say, um, you were born with the sun in Taurus, which is a kind of measurement. And then go on instantly to interpret that and then say, well, you may be a very sensual kind of person. An obstinate person, maybe. Taurians are supposed to be people who live in the real world. And so every zodiac sign represents a kind of measurement point that then straight away leads to a series of interpretations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now that you mentioned Taurus, which by the way is my sun sign, as you know, um, could we apply that same type of psychological deduction if we were talking about the charts of a nation or the, the chart of the independence of a country, which might be quite an important chart? Could we, could we deduce a way of being, a mindset, or to which extent? Well, um, my only answer to that is uh, perhaps. And I give that answer very, uh, I think, with a great deal of experience because uh, over 30 years ago I created the basic data collection of possible horoscopes for countries. And which we have here, as I showed you before. We, and so my conclusion after 30 years is inconclusive, which I think is fair enough because uh, there are no certainties in life apart from death and taxes, people <laughs> say. Um, and so I, I created this collection uh, full of enthusiasm for the idea that because there are cycles in the universe, there are patterns, the universe can be seen as unfolding in a, a single order, and so the order of human affairs must affect somehow the order of celestial affairs, and the idea then is that human beings move in waves, a little bit like animals migrating across the African savannah from spring to summer and back again, or birds migrating, human beings are the same. However, when we actually look at the data, it becomes very difficult to pin that down astrologically. So I'll still say, as uh, I think William Shakespeare said, there is a, a tide in the affairs of humanity, uh, periods of tension and, and relaxation. It's actually very difficult to pin that down astrologically. And so um, my conclusion to the question of whether we have charts for countries which work is that uh, sometimes they seem to and sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. But the question is um, whether that's liberating or not because I actually find it 
uh, massively liberating to think that there is um, uncertainty and we can't tie things down. So this says nothing about um, the truth or otherwise of uh, astrology. It just, said, it just means that when astrologers are working with charts for countries, there's a great deal of uncertainty. And the same applies to charts of people. Because countries are made up of, of, up of people. Um, and it actually becomes very, very difficult to read the chart of a person. Plenty of people watching this video may have been to an astrologer to have their horoscope cast. Some people may be astrologers. When you go to see an astrologer, there's a contract between you and the astrologer. So the astrologer can't sit there for an hour saying... I really don't know uh, about this. The astrologer has to, in a sense, perform for an hour, like any kind of therapist or advisor, like a financial advisor maybe, a you know, counsellor. But actually, uh, the, the meaning systems which astrology is constructed need to be interpreted. And there are no fixed interpretations. So the relationship between the astrologer and the person whose chart it is becomes uh, a sort of uh, negotiation, a dialogue. And it's a dialogue which only exists in that moment. Uh, it had, the meaning comes from that, the conversation in that moment. So when we look at uh, world affairs, uh, we're basically looking at an application of history. Okay. And the discipline of history, as practiced in universities and studied by historians, is very interpretive. It's concerned very much with establishing meaning to try and create some kind of context for the way the world is. And history actually emerged from astrology many thousands of years ago, probably as a discipline. So um, where I'm going with all this is actually uh, that um, astrology's uh, fundamental use is as a reflexive system. Okay, So it's one of many systems that developed in order to encourage people to think about themselves. So you might think, you know, I've got the sun in Taurus. What does that mean for me? How, how do I reflect on the meanings of what it is to be a Taurian? So, um, with countries, with Greece, for example, at the moment, what uh, is it to be Greek at the moment? What is the, what is the, the, the stage that Greece is at now? In my view, um, because, because I think that there is a good argument that there are cycles of revolution, um, Greece is going through a period um, at which it can complete the promise of the 1822 revolution. This is beyond the time span of most people. This is the way historians think, mm -hmm. long-term cycles. So... Um, most Greeks, understandably, are concerned with whether they can get their money out of the cash machine today. But in 1822, Greece declared independence from Turkey. And as is well known now, Greece has been uh, often ruled by a very corrupt oligarchy. And so the chance Greece has now is to... Uh, replace that oligarchy and complete its democratic revolution. Um, now, it was actually uh, Donald Tusk, the, uh, I think at the moment the president of the European Commission, Polish politician, who said that conditions in Greece at the moment, or in Europe as a whole, he said are very much like 1968. So in 1968, if you Google 1968, you will straight away find pictures of protesting students in Paris throwing petrol bombs, probably in Berlin as well. 
we, we are in a in a astrologically coherent phase of 1968. Yes. Uh, then there was the Uranus Pluto conjunction. Now they're in the next phase, which is the the waxing square. So Donald Tusk was probably unaware mm -hmm. that he was repeating a piece of news that you will find on many astrological websites and Facebook pages um, to, do, uh, to do with a, an understanding that certain key activities, like human activities, move in cycles. And the same, the same point in a cycle may come around again and again. And so, and so I mean, this is not just a, uh, a view which astrologers share. I mean, Donald Tusk grew up in communist Poland. He would have been educated in Marxist political theory. And Marxist theory is parallel with astrological theory. It also deals in phases of revolution. And cycles. And cycles. So, um, and he would, of course, be uh, very familiar with the uh, upset in the Eastern Bloc in 1989. Poland led the way in overthrowing its communist government. If Donald Tusk went on to a few more astrological Facebook pages and websites, he would find that, that 1989 is the uh, link between 1968 and this extended period from 2008 to uh, 2015. So, please tell us why. Um, because what does, does well, 1989 have in common with 1968 and the present? Ah, uh, the the link would be um, tight groupings of the distant outer planets, so mainly Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And um, there was uh, a very, a rather brilliant and original Frenchman called André Barbeau, who's still alive, he's in his 90s. And uh, André Barbeau created something called the Cyclical Planetary Index. And he, he, he uh, argued that you can create a graph like that, which shows that every time these outer planet cycles become very tight, then you get a period of great excitability and people are liable to overthrow their governments. And so in Barbeau's graph, you would have 1968 and the, the rebellions then, actually none of which did overthrow governments, they were all unsuccessful. And then 1989 in a, a phase of overthrowing the governments of Eastern Europe and then the current period uh, in which some governments were overthrown, but uh, we had the Arab Spring, but uh, largely unsuccessfully. More chaos has been created than people hoped. So it's a rather interesting theory, this theory of repetition. It goes back to the, uh, the ancient world. It's got deep roots in the Bible, actually. Mm -hmm. um, Back the, okay, fascinating thing. The early Christian theologians, when they looked at the Bible, looked at the New Testament, the Christian New Testament, the Old Testament, and saw repetition. And so they'd say, for example, uh, Jesus and Adam are the first archetype. They're the same archetype. So Adam created, was the first man who created sin. Jesus is the man, son of God, who redeems us from sin. They could go to the Bible. And the idea is that, that every time the same archetype comes by, the same underlying pattern, life falls back on top of itself. So we get something very interesting in this ancient philosophy being said about time, which is that time falls back on itself. It's classical Greek theory. Um, if you have ever read the wonderful book, uh, the science fiction novels, Dune, or seen the film, then uh, you'll know that time can be folded and the reason extreme travel is possible across large areas of the universe is that time can fold. This is actually classical Greek theory. And it's a theory which underpins this 
the theory of cycles, okay? So we don't just have a cycle going forward like this, but we actually come back to the same point. Mm -hmm. So... Could I, could I try to summarize some of this that you were saying about the psychological makeup of nations, peoples, societies? Yeah. Uh, we've had previous conversations on the subject of consciousness or the soul being in the chart or not. Mm. Um, you and I, I know of the, the type of astrologers who believe that the soul or consciousness or however you prefer to call it, is definitely not in the chart. So what happens when we apply this to the social scale? For me it would make sense that um, there was an even greater level of uncertainty on the social scale and that charts for nations and uh, businesses or any type of social or collective entity would, would be perhaps uh, loosely connected uh, between each other, that the charts would be loosely connected. However, there is something that I find very interesting in the favour of astrological evidence, and it's that not only does a chart give us a certain profile, certain information about the way it, um, a group of people seem to be at that time, but what I find most interesting is that when you take these um, different moments that you're mentioning of the history of, uh, for instance, Greece, in my experience, and from reading your book of world horoscopes, it seems that it is not my discovery. From my experience, it seems that there is such a thing as patterns of uh, signs which repeat themselves in those charts. Oh. And uh, perhaps sometimes it's parts of a sign, certain areas, certain degrees within each sign, or um, perhaps even types of planetary aspects. Yeah. So, um, would would you would you say that this is a common trait throughout the charts of of nations? Because I think probably very few people in the world have actually investigated as many mundane charts as yourself? Yeah. I'm going to dodge your question slightly. <laughs> okay. Because I have to refer to the great Greek philosopher Plato, who everybody should know about, and the great astronomer Johann Kepler okay. in the 17th century, who was a follower of Plato. And their theory was that the, the universe is constructed like a series of geometrical patterns. So, therefore, uh, the same geometrical pattern we might see unfolding in the sky must be, according to them, reflected in the unfolding of human life. And this is the fundamental theory of astrology. So I find it very difficult to talk about uh, astrology in any way without the theory, because the theory is everything. So that's great. So we can, we can assume that that's the case. Uh, now, as to how that works out in detail, is somet sometimes maybe clear, and sometimes isn't, and sometimes isn't. So because the planets do have uh, regular cycles, we do get these amazing patterns coming round. However, at the same time, um, another way of looking at the universe and lives is it's chaotic. Okay, so in chaos theory, you know, we get these wonderful patterns, fractals. But all the time new patterns are being started. So we get things called strange attractors. And a strange attractor might be a person or event that starts a new pattern. Uh, so let's look at, you know, strange attractors, let's look at people. Um, Alexis Tsipras may be a strange attractor. You know, the series of party coalesced around him. He became prime minister, he's still prime minister. So he's a strange attractor. Uh, and so new patterns are being started the whole time. And so we have 
this wonderful ancient image of the geometrical universe. But then we also have, when we look at the universe from another perspective, these new patterns going off. And so it's in the, these new patterns that any of us can start off a new sequence, a new uh, cycle of events. So um, when I looked at uh, mundane astrology you know, three decades ago, which was when I put this collection of data together, I thought, here's, here's a plan. We can investigate the nature of the universe according to these ancient theories. Um, and I still, I still think there's an investigation there because Johann Kepler said this is how the universe works. He thought we could plan politics according to these patterns. And so that's still, it's a, it's a useful uh, enterprise, but the results are inconclusive. So then we have the problem, but what do you do about it? And what do we as individuals do? How do we act in the world? And so I've always been a bit of a political creature. I used to be active for a while in the British Labour Party until I was disillusioned. And I've been in and out of the British Green Party as well. So the question is, is it to ask as individuals, um, what do we do at any moment? And in what, in what uh, role can we act as like, strange attractors? Because you can, every, anybody can start off their own small pattern. So back to the <coughs> your question of uh, big uh, patterns. Um, I think that Kepler was right. I think he was the great, one of the great towering geniuses of Western culture. And everybody who looks at this this YouTube straight away Google Johann Kepler and they'll find one of the, the greatest people, the greatest minds who ever lived. Um, and, I th and, and so I, I think he's, I think he's partly right. Now the question is that most astrologers don't really look at <clears throat> is what constitutes uh, data. Okay, what data do you take? for the starting point of your astrological investigation. And that's where the uncertainty lies and the chaos lies. So you'll find online, if you, you, you'll find a lot of uh, astrologers posting videos online where they explain history according to astrological factors. But many of them oversimplify because the world is in fact a very complicated place it's and, and we, we can't possibly understand it so what I would like people can't to possibly understand it all I we can't possibly understand it all yes we can maybe understand a little bit of it um, the bit closest to us uh, so if I got anybody to take anything away from watching this video it would be to think about what they themselves can do to uh, act in the world for the good of the world, but also to realise that there are no simple answers. And in fact, there is great sort of indeterminacy in the whole system. And so uh, astrology may partly uh, illuminate some areas of life, as sociology can, and economics can, and great painting can, and poetry. Um, but we're always looking through a glass darkly, which is a wonderful biblical phrase. Who said it? Maybe St Paul said it. We're looking through a glass darkly, because we're always peering through, and looking for, uh, trying to see the certainty, when in fact um, there is none. And it's in uncertainty that freedom lies. Well, um, it's been said for a long time that planets incline but do not oblige, and perhaps that would be a, a, a summary for for this section um, with a lot more analysis than 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 says that simple phrase and a lot more depth. Um, 
but it could perhaps be boiled down to this conclusion. Okay, so in this, in this, in this context, then, is there any room for prediction in social tension? The, the, the chart of Spain, that's where we are at the moment, or we know the chart of England or United States or Vietnam, um, if we know the history of the most important phases, can we possibly predict when those nations, countries, states might have their next significant phases, their most significant episodes or crises, perhaps? Um, we might do, I say, <laughs> open-mindedly. The thing is now, there's um, one uh, rather brilliant person in the UK called Michael Harding, who uh, has thought uh, extensively about astrology and what it does, and he said, the thing about astrology is that everything works once. <laughs> See? So, you never know exactly what's, what's going to happen next time, because partly because, because people um, learn from the past. So look at all the recent argument about whether, the predictions, the many predictions about whether Greece was going to leave the euro a few weeks ago. And it didn't. Now, there was a, it, it, it's a sort of hugely interesting problem for people to unravel then, because I if you... I would like to say something about that. Okay. I myself, um, this is how I think myself about prediction. I think about prediction in terms of probability. Mm. And the way you're, from what you're saying, it would sound as if probability and uncertainty are the, the, the names of the game. So how about prediction in, in, in terms of probability, of uncertainty, of mm. types of outcomes, types of itineraries? For example, I'll just say this with, with the Greece situation. I said that um, I spoke about what it would be like and feel like mm. from astrological parameters mm. yeah. if Greece stayed in the Euro and if Greece didn't stay in the Euro. Mm. I didn't venture as far as to say that it was actually clear mm. what would happen. But um, I won't go into the astrological parameters right now, but I, 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 I did think that it would be extremely tough on the, local, on the national self-esteem if they did leave. Uh, sorry, if they stayed within the Euro, um, and that it would be a wild adventure if they left. Now, I meant the wild very seriously. It seems like if they're staying, they're going to stay probably at least for some time, uh, but it is going to be very, very tough on their self-esteem. So, how about that? How about prediction in terms of probability, of com complexity, admitting complexity? Do you think yeah. astrologers are used to this? Okay. No. Perhaps we have the dream, the fantasy that we could pin things down that no, much. No, they're not. One of the great um, problems of astrology is the belief in certainty. Okay, within, <clears throat> within the world of astrology, almost every uh, magazine article, conference talk, class lecture shows how astrology works. Now, does astrology work all the time? Uh, if so, if it does, then every conceivable form of astrological technique or theory works all the time. And that means, of course, we can make up whatever theory or technique we like, which is in fact what has often happened. If it doesn't work all the time, then what, what does that say? And how do we find out what does work? One way of solving that problem is a very ancient one, which is to say, well, it, the astrology doesn't work without the presence of the astrologer. There needs to be an actual astrologer there. Well, that may be the case if you're looking at, you know, reading a horoscope as a, as a divinatory act. Now, there's one very strong current that runs the whole of Western astrology, which, which most astrologers seem to forget about, which is deep scepticism about astrology from within and at the overall world of uh, astrology. Okay, so 
Um, and that sceptical current actually says, okay, we can accept a universe where, broadly speaking, everything is linked. Emotions, the body, the planets, the earth, and so on. That's a, it's a fairly you know, reasonable hypothesis. But the details that astrologers then bring to that, that they've constructed, are actually uh, completely mistaken. And you, you can, you, you, all, all the work on this is available. And again, for anybody who's watching this, I would say um, Google um, Plotinus against the astrologers. Google that now and you'll find this wonderful uh, classical work. So, for example, we've got the problem of Indian astrology. Okay? The whole zodiac is um, shifted substantially from the Western zodiac. So we might talk about you know, Jupiter in the Western zodiac being in Cancer, and in the Indian zodiac it's not. So, so where do we go, go with that? Now, a lot of astrologers will say, well, the solution to that is that there are many different perspectives for looking at truth in the world. So, so then you go in Istanbul, who said to me, looking deep into my eyes, he said, there are as many truths in the petals and a flower as in the planets in the sky. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think that's a sentiment that, that many astrologers will probably subscribe to. So it's a very poetic way of, of uh, seeing truth. But at the same time, uh, astrology tends to deal with certainty and the search for questions and the search for answers. And astrologers generally present themselves as people who have access to some deeper truth. But they, um, they may not. You know. Well, we're and still that, human beings. No, we're still human beings, exactly, you see. And so a, a degree of humility uh, is necessary. And also, I think, a much higher priority should be given. If I had a wish for the world of astrology as a whole, it would be that many more questions are asked, but also a much higher priority given to those schools of astrology that deal in uncertainty rather than certainty. But of course, you know, people are people. People want answers to questions. I want answers to questions. If I go to the doctor with a problem and I don't get a pill or some kind of solution, I'm dissatisfied. So astrologers are in the, in, in the same position. They're culturally pushed in, into a position of having to uh, provide answers to questions. I, I think it's similar in a way uh, to... Um, I love the example of a kitchen knife. I use the example of a kitchen knife for many things. We are people who look for order. People mm. do look for order, all of us. Astrologers take it a step further and we use correlations mm. with um, external objects to ourselves. Um, and at the same time, we can go too far in this search, in this quest, and, and realizing mm. that it is actually there, that there is something, we can take it too far. And you can use a kitchen knife for the wrong purpose. Mm. So. Mm. Maybe, maybe we're just very human. <laughs> no, I, I think you're right. I mean, and we lose sight of it. <laughs> look, I've seen human beings described as meaning-making machines. A lot of, out, out there in the world of science, there's lots of cognitive scientists who will talk about the way in which human beings have to construct meaning and have to construct order. And eye specialists will know that you know the eye almost fabricates what we think we see in order for the brain to be able to, to function. So all, all this is, uh, all this is uh, true. I think we can't get up in the morning if we don't have a sense of order. Mm. Um, and uh, I think that, that this is always within, again, within the world of astrology, one of my big interests is actually how astrology functions as a as a, as a cultural system, there's always attempts to reform it. There's always 
perpetual attempts to say, look, what astrologers are saying is not good enough. It needs to be reformed and changed. But the general tide of events of people needing answers and astrologers being there to, to provide it is too strong. And anyway, uh, if, you, if you think about any area of activity needing to be reformed, then it's difficult because you have to think what needs reforming and how am I going to reform it. Mm-hmm. But uh, <clears throat> within you know, the, 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 the world of uh, astrology, there are these strong undercurrents. They just don't get noticed very often, least of all by astrologers and least of all by astrologers. Uh, this sort of surge now of astrology that takes place on Facebook and uh, social media. Okay, um, thank you. I think I'm going to move on to a different type of question. This has been very, very interesting. And we're going to be back with more questions about uh, the possibility of social change, ethics, and how we might be able to apply all this very, very interesting, relativistic, undetermined recognition of this this phenomenon. So follow us in the next part. Thank you. Okay, so we're back here with a second phase of, of this interview. Um, I'm very interested that as an astrologer you've also been involved with uh, political activity. It could seem that if an astrologer is someone who normally, typically, you would expect to believe in things being destined or there being patterns of time mm-hmm. that, some, that perhaps you couldn't escape a certain say, sense of fate. I do find it very interesting that you're actually politically involved. I am myself as well. But I'd like to ask you about this because um, personally I'm someone who hopes for a better future and I do believe in um, a sense of positive change that starts in the, in, in the individual and can spill out to, to, to other levels. So, um, how do you feel about the subject as regards astrology and are there any examples from history uh, that could enlighten this, this, this issue? Well, to start off with, okay, uh, all people have multiple identities. And so, you know, the identity astrologer is one of many identities which any individual will have. So... Um, that's one point. So there's only within, I'd say, the world of astrology, sort of one particular s- e- extreme school of thought which says, hey, you know, we can't really affect the world at all. We can't affect events. All we can do is determine how we respond to those events. And I'm not really sure how anybody really actually feels about that anyway, because to be completely passive is not human. And one of the people that espoused that theory very strongly was actually the, uh, the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Now, he was Roman Emperor. I don't think he sat around saying, oh, there's nothing we can do about it, so I'm just going to stay in the palace all day and not do anything. Another person who thought the same was um, the Roman philosopher Seneca, who was actually tutor to the Emperor Nero. Mm-hmm. the young Emperor Nero. I don't think he sat around really saying, well, oh, my philosophy tells me that the future is destined and so there's nothing I can do about it. I think he got up every morning and did something. So as whatever people say they think as human beings, they're going to act and do something. And so, so people act. And in fact, paradoxically, there may be a tendency to believe that the, the future is predetermined and act even more positively. So that, for example, if you think that Jesus Christ is coming soon, which is very common prophecy in European history, or that the workers' revolution is coming, as many people thought in the 19th and 20th centuries, then you don't sit around waiting for it to happen. You go out there 
and spread the good news about Jesus coming or fight for the revolution. So there's this paradoxical tendency in people. It's a very two-way subject. They think, they think oh, the, yeah, exactly. So the future is predetermined, it's going to happen, and therefore I actually have to make it happen. So um, there's a paradox that was noticed by the philosopher Karl Popper in the 1950s. So astrology has usually been used in politics to manage the future. So if we go to India, where astrology is very much a part of the political culture, politicians don't sit around passively just waiting for something to unfold. They'll ask their astrologer, when is the best time to act? And so I would imagine the current Prime Minister is using astrology all the time. He's a Hindu nationalist. Um, he's part of a political party that has been reasserting traditional Indian values. They insist on astrology being taught in, in universities. So, so Modi, the Indian Prime Minister, is going to be saying to his astrologers, I want to know what time to have a vote in Parliament. I want to know what time to have an election. So it's very active. So, I mean, my own political engagement dates back 40 years to a time when I was just actually uh, studying astrology. And I never thought the two really um, matched up at all. My political engagement came very much out of um, uh, my role in squatting politics in London. And it, it, squatting is when you have to occupy empty property. So, so we've got you know different issues here. I'm trying to highlight. One is that as individuals, we have multiple identities. We may think one thing but do another, and also that when it comes to astrology and politics is always emphasised action. Every king, pope, emperor who used astrology did so in order to consciously gain an advantage on their rivals and their, <coughs> their, their enemies. You know, astrology was used in the Middle Ages sometimes to fight battles. You wanted to know the time to attack your enemy. I'm not sure how often that happened, but there were rules constructed for when to attack your enemy's castle. So it's always, you know, the, the idea has always been there's an active engagement. What do you think it might look like when, um, in a possibly a close future, we are more astrologically aware and there's more astrologers doing more jobs, more electional charts that are uh, choosing the right moment for something um, and more astrological awareness. Have you, have you thought about that? Um, yes, I have. And I don't think it would bring any benefits. And the reason is because having astrological awareness or believing in astrology or practicing it doesn't make you a better person or a nicer person. So, for example... Are you meaning astrology, sorry, in general, as a whole? Electional astrology? Well, look, the Emperor Nero, who I just referred to uh, a few minutes ago, has gone out in history as one of the great barbaric savages of history. Now, um, when he was proclaimed emperor, the moment for his proclamation was chosen astrologically. You know, it was actually very simple. I, I think that all that mattered was that the sun, which is the great symbol of imperial power, was, was overhead, it was midday. So uh, I, I knew um, another a Pakistani astrologer once in London, and he told me how he had been consulted by the Pakistani government, the, the, the military government of General Zia or Haq, uh, on the death of um, Bhutto, 
the Prime Minister who'd been overthrown by the military junta. And the astrologer described to me the position he was in. He's been consulted by one of the by a supremely unpleasant government that's largely responsible for the flourishing of the Taliban. Very evil. Uh, this this astrologer's uh, family were in Pakistan at the time, so he was he was very aware of what could happen to them. What he told me was that he, on looking at Bhutto's chart, you know, sincerely using astrological factors, predicted a violent death for Bhutto. So uh, the military government in Pakistan took that as, uh, in this astrologer's account, the military government took that as the excuse to execute Bhutto. So to murder the previous prime minister. So. You know, astrology doesn't exist outside of any other ethical system in the world. You know, we can look at uh, the Nazis. There's, there, there, there is a story that Hitler used astrology, which I don't think he did. I think he despised it. But several people very close to him did use it, such as uh, Rudolf Hess, who for many years was his deputy. He used astrology. Um, Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS, right? believer in astrology. So I don't think we can look forward to a period, uh, I don't think there's any reason to argue that if, if more astrologers advised more governments, the world would be a better place, because those governments might just be interested in killing their enemies. So, so that takes us on to ethics and ethical systems, and uh, whether you know, we, the need, in other words, to live by some kind of ethical system. Astrology is completely neutral. It's completely amoral. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it has no inbuilt uh, ethics. People can maybe argue there's an ethical system. For example, they could say, well, it, it's, astrology says we should live in harmony with the universe. But then the question is, which universe? You know, the universe of Heinrich Himmler, Rudolf Hess. You know, so, so astrology as a whole has no uh, inbuilt morality. It is just a system. It's not economics. It's just a system for, un- for understanding the world. And so ultimately you know, individuals have to live by some kind of uh, ethical system. It's a struggle most of us have to cope with our consciences, cope with difficulties in the world around us. And you know, right now, how do we cope with this, all these immigrants leaving North Africa and coming to Europe? I mean, the most, there's the most horrific tragedies. And all of us who are sensitive about this have to kind of try and find some way of understanding this is happening right now. But, but how, do, how do we deal with it? So we all have ethical uh, basis for judging such situations. So, and that's completely separate to, uh, to uh, any use of astrology. And, uh, plenty of people who advise uh, banks, corporations and companies uh, using astrology, uh, it's always impossible to find out really what goes on because such work is always confidential. And it's, there's always a high deniability factor because very few people who run a business want to be found out for using astrology because their reputations would suffer. But such advice is always given completely irrespective of any ethical considerations. You know, what happens if you're an astrologer who is advising a company that is thinking of laying off thousands of workers? For example, where, where, where's your ethical position then? You're probably just going to look at the Uranus aspect or, and say, yes, this is a good time to cut your workforce. But each person who, is, uh, who loses their job may represent an individual tragedy. I found a video that was very interesting where you were speaking about past cycles that were um, similar to what we have active at the moment. And you were referring to the... Um, 
the last time there was a square between uh, Uranus and Pluto, like there is now, like there has been from 2010 to 2016, approximately. And um, I remember you said something that to me which was, was quite interesting. You said that um, last one being a waning phase, you considered it, uh, put it this way, a death-oriented phase. Whereas the present one, or the one that was starting, that we're into now, was a waxing phase and that could be life and peace oriented. I wonder how you feel and think about this now. Would you say that you agree with that statement? I disagree with it. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm increasingly in a phase of sort of deconstructing all my past work, beginning with the book uh, Mundane Astrology, which published 31 years ago now, and in that book, written with my two friends, Michael Bajant and Charles Harvey, we borrowed from Dane Raja, or rather, so, Dane Raja, now to recap, flourishing from the 1930s onwards, was a bit of a philosopher who wrote a series of very influential works about astrology, and he is largely responsible for this idea that uh, in astrology planetary phases have uh, waxing and waning cycles, so growth cycle and a dying cycle. And so then the Uranus-Pluto square in 1933 was the closing cycle and the one we have now is an opening cycle, a waxing one. So Rudyard's work is often very neat and very satisfying. It's aesthetically pleasing. Uh, you know, physicists talk of sometimes about their favourite theories being aesthetically pleasing. Uh, well, Rudyard's work is aesthetically pleasing. But then um, I went back and looked at Johann Kepler, of course, is largely responsible for the idea that that planetary cycles uh, correspond with the ebb and flow of human politics. But well, if you look at Kepler, I can't see any particular I idea that they are waxing and, and waning cycles. So, so I thought, well, Rudyard's projected this onto the the situation. Okay, so why should we accept Rudyard as true? Kepler was interested in establishing empirical data. Okay, Kepler wanted to chuck out the whole of astrology and begin again as far as possible by looking at what, in terms of planetary cycles, could be shown to correspond with earthly cycles. And it seems to me that that uh, that respect for uh, an empirical data is a very, very important one because it takes us away from that position of saying, you know, anything in astrology works, or which to me is an unsustainable position. And so Kepler was open to the idea that maybe nothing in astrology works. Why should it? You know, what's the problem? Um, so, but anyway, there's, there's that respect for empirical data. So, one problem that, I, that I'm at now, if I look back at my work from 30 and more years ago, is that we were providing answers and not asking nearly enough questions. Mm -hmm. So, if you look at the book Mundane Astrology, it's full of examples of how <clears throat> astrology works. Actually, a lot of it is encyclopedic. A lot of it is a, is a, a summary, a literature review of what other people in the 20th century mainly had said about mundane astrology. But all our examples in, showed astrology working. We didn't have examples of astrology not working and so if there's a position that I'm at, if there's a dissatisfaction I have now with my work from back then is that it needs to be recast in a much more critical and questioning mode uh, rather than starting from the theoretical proposition 
that it works and showing how it works. You've got to actually be a bit more critical and ask uh, whether there are correspondences, as Kepler thought, and then if so, what the value of them are. Now, Kepler thought you could manage politics. I'll give you um, an example that he produced. He said, if you see a revolutionary period coming up ahead, which for him might have been a combination of the planets Mars and Saturn, you can do two things. One is you should strengthen the police force, so you know, round up potential subversives. And the other is you identify causes of um, dis discontent and establish reforms. So it seems to me that, that, that Kepler was establishing a basic a social democratic perspective as we have in Europe now. You know, if you've got some extremists, you might want to keep a close eye on them. Uh, but then, you know, it seems to a, ref a few reforms to remove discontent as well. So Kepler thought you could do that. That was the value for him of establishing an empirically based astrology, uh, which, which worked on the basis of evidence rather than theory in order to better manage society. So, um, should we lock up dissidents, as Kepler thought? Well, it depends who they are. Um, certainly don't think we should be locking up green activists, but anyway, that's my politics. Hopefully uh, not. <laughs> yeah, so if we look at that whole distinction between the waxing and the waning uh, side of uh, cycles, I'd say why. And I know this is a point which many astrologers uh, get horrified if you question, but a lot of astrologers get horrified if you question anything. Like a lot of astrologers, if you say, let's take Mercury retrograde, for example. Only since the, I'd say since the, probably the early 1980s, has the superstition developed that when Mercury is retrograde, communications won't work out, letters will get lost, well now it's emails won't arrive. Um, there are astrologers I know who, d who won't uh, sign official documents when Mercury's retrograde, or even travel when Mercury's retrograde, which seems to me to be the height of foolishness because the rest of the world carries on while Mercury's retrograde. Emails arrive, people travel. Um, so a ridiculous superstition has arisen only in the last 30 years. It didn't occur in astrological literature before the early 80s. Um, until that point, the only use of Mercury retrograde was uh, in the judgment of uh, horary questions, mm -hmm. then it's only got extended to the whole of astrology. And yet if you challenge this, a lot of astrologers will, will, will kind of get upset and the, the moment I don't get an email or something, they'll say, aha, you see, Mercury's retrograde, or if it's not, it probably will be. So um, it's very difficult to challenge uh, accepted wisdom in astrology. Astrology is a tremendously conservative discipline. It's always innovating a little bit, but it innovates by adding information and adding techniques. So, again, in the last 30 years, um, <coughs> the use of asteroids has been added to astrology, often quite deliberately because there are more asteroids with female names. So you can select female asteroids and add them to a horoscope in order to deliberately create a female balance to, 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 to counter the preponderance of male planetary names. So astrology works by accretion, by adding. And it does forget things. Gradually, you know, certain techniques will be, will be dropped. I mean, when, when in the great extinction crisis of the 18th century, in Western astrology, uh, a huge amount was 
lost, it's only been recovered recently. But astrology very rarely works by challenging its own assumptions. It's intensely conservative. Uh, and there is no real, really no mechanism for it to, to challenge its own assumptions because anything in astrology can be shown to work. You know, so uh, if you're looking to explain something with astrology, you might normally do it with you know, a Venus-Jupiter trine. You can say, ah, oh, okay, um, but, oh, look, well, we didn't have a Venus-Jupiter trine, but we did have a Venus-Jupiter square, or, um, or the moon was in Taurus, which is another kind of Venusian. So it always works by finding another explanation. So it's, it's like a kind of word association, uh, which is fine if we think of astrology as poetry, and lots of astrologers describe astrology as poetry. But then normal poetry, as poets write, does not claim some sort of objective correspondence for its truths with the positions of the planet. And so uh, the description of astrology as poetry is aesthetically pleasing, but ultimately not satisfactory. <laughs> well, OK. Thank you very much, Nick. I think it's a very, very challenging conversation. You've said a lot of things that will probably oblige many of us astrologers to rethink a lot of our premises. Uh, I believe it's probably for the good. It's, uh, there's a lot of healthy uh, rethinking to do here and even if it's just for the pleasure of exercising our Mercuries, whether they're retrograde or not. So thank you very much and all the best to you astrologers out there and people who are watching us and take care and be well. Thank you Nick. Thank you.